Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome to episode 23 of the Trauma Informed Lens podcast. Um, today we're going to talk about one topic that I'm really fascinated with, and I'm so happy to have James and Susie Kowalski here uh, with us today from Chicago. Uh, uh, friends of mine from uh, different conferences. Uh, James, I think we've known each other almost for five years or so now. Um, and so just really a key topic for me, it was really one of the driving reasons why I wrote the book Connecting Paradigms, uh, because I see harm reduction so important to our thinking about the trauma-informed lens, trauma-sensitive schools, and really how we approach our work in general. And then I know you guys have really created practical uh, interventions around this, this concept too. So um, your, your mix of expertise is perfect for this topic, and I'm excited to to have you both here. So um, we, as always, we uh, start out with our bright, shiny objects of the week. And uh, Kurt, let me uh, start with you this week. Um, first, I mean, welcome, James and Susie. I'm just excited to have you guys on the podcast today. Uh, my, my bright, shiny object of the week is a, uh, a guy named Joseph Grenny. And I just discovered this guy. Apparently, he's got several best-selling books, and uh, I just found out about him. Uh, so I, he he uh, he's got a great TED talk out there that I got a chance to watch, and it's kind of turned me on to some of his some of his books. Um, he is uh, a uh, social scientist who's been writing a lot for the business world about communication, about how to to engineer change. And one of his points, I think, that is a really good one. He talked about if you um, want to make large scale changes. Uh, he talks a lot about how you define the problem and that, that's always a really important point, I think. And, and I, of course, like his point because his ultimate point was that if you really want to change the world, you need to change people's behavior. And that kind of fits right with my model. And uh, so I, I enjoyed listening to his talk. He certainly has a, a cool model out there where he talks about um, recognizing and identifying uh, values that lead to behavior change, like personal values, social environments, social structures, and environmental structures. So if you get a chance to check him out, I think uh, his TED Talk is really great. He's a great speaker, great entertainer. Um, it was one that was fun for me to discover. So I enjoyed that, and I used it. I actually used his TED Talk in a couple of trainings last week, so it was really enjoyable for me to find. Very, very cool. And let's uh, send me that link, and we'll put it in the show oh. notes. Well, That's great. for our audience. So, Jerry, my friend, what's your uh, bright, shiny object of the week? You know, uh, changing behavior, changing minds, you know, uh, it's all, I, I've been, uh, you know, I, I think I've talked about it for a couple of weeks now of uh, focusing on how dysregulated leadership is in nonprofit agencies, right? And so I've been doing some reading, um, reading findings, Finding Space to Lead uh, by Janet, I think her Matter Reno or something, um, and uh, The Mind of a Leader, but really trying to understand how stress um, in these organizations is really changing people's perception of time um, and helping people develop practices within the organization to deliver best practice. Oftentimes we start with best practice and um, because of people's um, stress state, um, they really can't continually um, deliver it with fidelity. So um, doing a lot of work with organizations now of uh, working with leadership teams on regulate, really the same things we're paralleling, you know, talking about regulation, talking about connections, talking about um, understanding self, understanding others. So. Um, it's been some pretty exciting reading to do. Very cool. Very cool. We'll, we'll put uh, that author on there as well in any books Jerry's reading too. So my bright, shiny object of the week is really our guest today. It, it's a joy to have both of these. 
uh, of folks with us. James is one of those people I, I've met, you know, if, if, you, if you're watching the video, he, he kind of looks like 12 when you see him. And, and at the same time, he opens his mouth and it just blows you away. And uh, uh, he always is, the other thing that stood out for James, I remember him in the first presentation. I think he sat in mine before I sat in his. And then we, we connected in Houston, of all places. Uh, uh, where, where I, I got to spend, I think we spent a whole day with each other in, in trainings, uh, uh, day one and day two. And just, uh, just uh, one of those people that I met, and he's always this well-dressed, really, I mean, things are tucked in, things are ironed, and then you become his Facebook friend, and he, he like dresses like me in normal life. So uh, <laughs> that was one of my first impressions is, man, this guy knows how to iron, because everything looks good. <laughs> looks like he actually got fitted for his clothes. Uh, and, then, and then I get to meet Susie and uh, Portland, and she's like, yeah, he just kind of just walks around trashy most of the day. Like, <laughs> it's funny that that's your perception of him. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's just, it's great to see, you know, as I get older and older, it's like meeting folks like James and then, and then Susie and just kind of wondering like, you know, what department of the government are these two going to be running someday? Uh, uh, just because of the brilliance and, and to watch their career and, uh, uh, you know, getting to meet them and then, you know, social media is so great in some ways and so awful in others, but uh, to see the pictures of your wedding and all that stuff, I just feel like it's such a cool thing. Uh, to, to, to be a, a small part of watching you two uh, grow as, as people, but, but also professionals. And now since I sound like an old grandfather sort, uh, I, I, will, I will pass it over to you, James and Susie. So uh, just kind of what, what are you guys thinking about right now? What are some things that uh, are kind of drawing your attention uh, in the world? Um, so I just listened to my first ever audio book. Um, but it was Johan Hari's Lost Connections, um, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression. And I loved it. First of all, I just am um, really fascinated by the like modality of an audiobook. Um, there's always all these books that I want to read, but I just feel like I don't have time. But I have time in my car every day, driving to and from work. So I was able to listen to it that way. Um, but I really like the way that he really emphasizes the importance of connection um, in a lot of the different types of struggles that people experience. Um, and that he kind of talks about like disconnection as being a driving force in people's like emotional health. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in thinking about like working with people who've experienced trauma, um, it's also really helpful to think beyond kind of a medical model of just needing antidepressants or a different type of like chemical in your body um, and thinking about sort of like the circumstances that create these situations for folks. So it's something that I've really enjoyed listening to. Um, and yeah, I'm a big fan of. Yeah. Um, Matt, thank you for that really warm uh, introduction. That is very <laughs> sweet of you. I will say, um, you definitely have it nailed correctly. I am the ironer in our family. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> the other, so I did want to also just mention, you know, for people who are unfamiliar with Johan Hari, he previously released a book called Chasing the Scream. Um, and that was more about kind of the role that connection and disconnection plays in people's substance use. And so um, there's a great TED talk about that as well, if you kind of want the, the cliff notes of it. Um, the other bright, shiny object, uh, something that Susie and I have been reading together, actually, is the Harry Potter series. And uh, not because we're trying to dig into the tr themes of trauma related to Harry Potter, although that could be an interesting podcast also. Um, more so, um, Harry Potter has sort of become our way of disconnecting at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, when we're getting ready for bed, we'll do a little reading about Harry Potter. And sometimes it's nice to come home and just think about wizards and not all the you know, stressful trauma that we see um, or hear about from people's lives every day. So those are our bright, shiny objects. <laughs> What's your favorite Harry Potter book so far? Well, James has actually never read them. Uh, he's only seen the movies. Uh, so right now we're on book three. Yes. Um, that's probably one of my favorites overall. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't read any of them either. I've only seen the movie, so I, I should probably read the books or listen to it on an audio book, actually. <laughs> One of those things that people is sort of like telling them you've never seen Star Wars and they look at you like, what? Yeah, right, 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 right. 
<laughs> so I would love to, to learn a little bit more about what you guys do on a daily basis. And, and, and certainly uh, when we think about harm reduction, um, substance use comes to mind is the first thing that pops into my head uh, when we think about harm reduction. Um, but it, I'd just love to kind of learn like what you guys do and what your jobs are um, and kind of what, where, where, you, where you're sitting in, in the world at this point. Cool. So um, I'll start. My, so I, you know, my name's James. Um, right now, I'm actually working on a master's degree in social work. So I'm at University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. And um, I am actually interning in an outpatient substance use treatment program. My background is in um, doing street outreach work. So primarily trying to engage people who are homeless and have a mental illness and link them to healthcare services and housing. Um, and that's actually how Susie and I met is we were doing street outreach together um, for several years at Heartland Alliance here in Chicago. And so um, about five years ago, I started doing training mostly with community mental health providers, but also social service agencies around housing first and harm reduction motivational interviewing, trauma-informed care. Um, I've kind of kept that up, um, you know, while in school, slowed down a lot <laughs> because of school, but um, still doing that here and there and um, doing training now, mostly around um, drug overdose education and naloxone distribution. So Chicago Recovery Alliance here in Chicago has been doing um, syringe exchange and naloxone distribution for over 20 years. They were, you know, one of the original programs um, operating and distributing those supplies to people who use drugs. And so I feel really honored to be part of that history of the history of that organization and that I get to work and volunteer there now. Um, and mostly what I'm doing there is training um, substance use treatment providers and social service providers on how to administer naloxone, but also how to train their participants and get it into the client's hands as well. Yeah. Um, what we find is most effective in terms of naloxone distribution is making sure that people who actually use drugs themselves have access to the medication because they're the ones who are most likely to be there in the event of emergencies. Right, so. right, right, right. Susie, how about you? Like, what, 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 do you, what do you do on a daily basis these days? Driving to work, listening to audiobooks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I work full time in, a, in an outpatient, intensive outpatient substance use treatment program on the west side of Chicago, um, which is a neighborhood that's been significantly impacted by overdose. Um, and just heroin use. It's kind of an open air drug market in the neighborhood. Um, and so I work there as a counselor and then I also supervise a team of counselors. And our program is pretty new. We're only about two years in. Um, the agency we're at is, uh, has been around for quite a while. But what's really different about our program is that we operate from a harm reduction philosophy. And so we're providing treatment, um, substance use treatment uh, within a harm reduction context. Um, my background is really more in doing trauma therapy. Um, so although I work in a treatment program, I really identify first and foremost as a trauma therapist. Um, so it's kind of the unifying theme of everyone I've served throughout my career um, is that they've experienced significant trauma. Um, and in doing this work and talking with people, what I've learned is that a lot of the direct service providers don't feel particularly well supported in their work. Um, so that kind of drove me and a colleague to develop Roots Counseling and Training Solutions. So we do counseling and training, uh, or not counseling, consultation, training, and supervision for direct service providers, um, both locally and across the country. Right, right. Well, that kind of delves into, Jerry, something you were saying about the stress within organizations. And, mm -hmm. and, and that it just kind of tied in for me as you were talking about people feeling not enough support or that they don't have the right skill or information to do their jobs. And some of that can be an actual lack of skill and some of it can of course be that they get stressed out and overwhelmed and then get kind of stuck. Um, so I, I wonder if we think about this idea of harm reduction and how is, it, how is that different than another kind of an approach to substance use. Uh, either, and, and I'd love to get you know, all three of your thoughts about, about how those things are different. Um, maybe James, I could start with you on that and, and just give me your take on it. So um, I guess if we're trying to distinguish between kind of what makes harm reduction different from other approaches to substance use treatment, I think it has to do primarily with um, being very much rooted in a client-centered approach so not having prescriptive um, 
outcomes or prescriptive pathways for how to achieve those outcomes for people. So being client-centered, I think, is really fundamental to practicing harm reduction. And then developing a menu of options. And so oftentimes harm reduction is sort of contrasted with abstinence-only approaches. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we recognize that harm reduction includes abstinence. Um, so Jeannie Little, a couple years ago, wrote a really nice piece called um, Under, the, Under the Harm Reduction Umbrella and talked about how abstinence is a really important strategy for a lot of people who are pursuing um, changes around their substance use. So right, right. Is one strategy that can reduce harm in a harm reduction approach. Right. Um, and then there's a whole range of other strategies from you know, making changes around your pattern of substance use to making changes in other parts of your life. Um, and I think actually you know, where Susie works, a lot of the clients that she sees um, are people who are engaging in a harm reduction program but are personally pursuing abstinence. So as long as it's a self-selected, client-centered goal, um, abstinence is definitely still part of the picture in harm reduction. Right, right. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because you're just going on a pathway towards a certain change rather than going from all the way from total substance use to total abstinence in one step, right? So having a pathway along there. Right. And catch the, like the line that we use, um, you know, that sh that comes from Chicago Recovery Lines is any positive change. So we'd say any positive change as a person defines it for him or herself, um, that that people not only have a right to pursue whatever positive change they identify, but that we should really support and celebrate and honor and recognize the work that they do when they make any positive change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Susie, anything you'd add to that? Yeah. That was a great. That was a great kind of summary. I think that was it was well said. So thanks. Yeah, I think that one of the other parts of harm reduction that's important to consider, um, and, you know, I think we both like to distinguish between like specific risk reduction strategies. So things like needle exchange or like condom use or even like reduction in use um, from like a broader sort of like philosophy of care. So we can have like specific um, strategies that we might address with someone that might put them at a little bit less risk, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're operating within a harm reduction philosophy. Um, so I think of like, for example, sometimes um, with like teenagers, we might give them condoms um, to like reduce the risks associated with like sexual activity, but the message is often still like don't have sex. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not sort of like working with what's important to you and what is your goal? We're still sort of prescribing a goal, um, but offering like a harm reduction strategy. Right, right. I mean, one thing that pops into my head, this is a real simple example, right, was uh, my experience in basic training in the military. Mm -hmm. And in the military, right, you go and learn how to shoot a gun. And one of the things that is a big deal is to keep track of all of the ammunition so that there isn't live rounds hanging around. And they have amnesty boxes. And so that if you find a live round of ammunition, you won't get in trouble for turning it in, basically. Because they know, I mean, these are my drill sergeants, right? Like you don't want to get into trouble. And so they had to kind of do that because they would find that by, they had tried the strategy of being very, very strict on the, if you got found with having live ammunition, you would be in really big trouble to have being, if you turn it in, we don't say anything about it. Like it is not, it is not a problem because they wanted to get you to turn it in. Uh, kind of an oversimplified example of, of this <laughs> the same kind of concept that if we really want to reduce some risk, then we might have to let go of some of some of the longstanding values that that we might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we see that like punitive approaches generally don't increase like communication. So I would say that that's another big component of harm reduction is that we're talking with the person about what's important to you. What are you trying to work on? Where do you eventually want to be? And it's really hard for us to have that like open line of communication yeah, if yeah. there's sort of, like the threat. There's the, the threat of punishment hanging over your head. <laughs> yeah. And I think what also really connects, you know, from your example to harm reduction is kind of what you said about letting go in some ways is we have to decide what we want our ultimate target to be. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as it relates to your example, it's like, is it most important that you catch any one person who is violating this rule, or is the most important thing that there's no live ammunition or yeah. live round? And if you put the goal there, then it kind of shifts the way that you might approach this, this um, situation. Same right. thing with substance use. So 
most of our substance use systems really put an emphasis on abstinence only, as opposed to putting an emphasis on reduction in overdose deaths or reduction in transmission of diseases. And so harm reduction, I think, really comes in and says, okay, substance use is a fact of life and risky behavior in general is something that happens in society. So instead of trying to eliminate that risky behavior altogether, why don't we look at ways to reduce the potential harm of it? And I think we got, for the first time in history, James and Susie, correct me with your, if I'm wrong, harm reduction and a military example. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have not, I, have not I, I, I gotta be honest, I've never thought about harm reduction in a military context. <laughs> As always, what a perfect example uh, with that. So. You know, one of the thinkings as I've, again, uh, my exposure, it's funny, I went through, and, and Jerry, I kind of wonder if you've had any different opinion. I went through years of in child welfare and juvenile justice without ever hearing the term harm reduction. And it just, it, it's kind of astounding because it was around, it was developing, it was changing the way people were thinking about care delivery. And um, it wasn't until I uh, got into the HIV world around uh, 2003 where this term started um, popping up. Um, and, and so it's something relatively new and something that sort of developed a, a little bit earlier from knowing the history of uh, harm reduction than, than maybe the term trauma-informed care at least coming up. I, I really love to get your thinking um, and, and open up to a larger conversation with all of us about how do you see, uh, as I know you guys think a lot about trauma-informed care as well, trauma-informed care and harm reduction, how do those uh, work together? What's the relationship in, in your thinking? So one of the interesting things is, like as I mentioned, my background is really in doing trauma therapy. Um, and like you, Matt, I didn't really hear the term harm reduction until a little bit later in my career. Um, and having worked with people who had experienced trauma, it felt really natural and like, of course, this is how you work with people who've experienced trauma. So it's more just like a term um, and a phrase to like describe something that felt really um, like sort of well understood and like part and parcel of doing any kind of trauma work. Um, and I think James has had kind of that, you know, uh, mirror reaction, like similar experience in doing like harm reduction and um, coming to like trauma-informed care. Yes, actually, so I came into the direct service field and the agency that I chose, I came to specifically because I had learned about harm reduction and I wanted to do direct service from a harm reduction approach. And so in doing harm reduction work, that's actually how I discovered trauma-informed care. So we do kind of have that kind of way of, it, you know, both, both approaches kind of brought, brought us to the other one, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I find it's, you know, a very, you know, as getting harm reduction and trauma-informed care kind of at the same time, it, you know, I, I got enough of the current approach to criminal justice. Uh, a lot of times, you know, with, with Kurt, when he talks about behavioral change, it, is I was really approaching it not only kind of, kind of in, a, in the wrong way from a neurobiological perspective, but, but also just of how I started services. I remember I, I was hopefully one of the last of the generation, even though I know you can still find these of absence only substance abuse treatment. It's like, hey, you know, to get our services, you, you gotta be sober. And when I, like, what were we thinking? Like, like, like uh, you know, in hindsight, why didn't I think this makes zero sense whatsoever? I knew it wasn't working, but it's really amazing to see sort of this, this uh, revolution in our, in our thinking uh, come hand in hand. And, and Jerry, I, I'd love to get some of, your reflections on this too is uh, probably in the child welfare environment that we were both working in, not something that was talked about a whole lot. I'd just love to get your impressions on, on this concept. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about substance abuse and, and really um, a lot of substance abuse was you know, your 12-step your programs, right? So they, they worked really well. A matter of fact, the outcomes for 12-step programs were fantastic compared to what was going on. But somehow we looked at the people that it was working for and not the people it wasn't working for, right? And so you tend to then say, if it's not working, the program's not working, it's because of you. 
as opposed to having a different lens in which to kind of understand that. The same thing with a variety of treatments traditionally is if you respond to treatment, um, you're a good candidate for the treatment. If you're not, there's something wrong with you as opposed to we have to have a different way of thinking about things, right? So, you know, I, I think that um, back when we started, we really were focusing on really changing behavior. And that the behavior was that we were trying to change with substance abuse or it was aggression or it was right if we could change the behavior. But we had very little capacity to really understand the person behind that behavior. And, I, and really what I hear harm reduction really does is it, it's, it's a way of um, really meeting the person. Um, the, you know, the analogy would be is I go into a restaurant and I, I pick up the menu and because I can read what's on the menu, I think I know what the food tastes like, right? It's like the, the structures and the, and the menu direct, but we still have to have an experience with the food that we're eating and, and does, do I like it? Do I not like it? What do I want? So what I hear James and, and Susie talking about is, is really having an overall philosophy of me of in some ways figuring out one is what what how this kind of behavior right how is it serving this person and and what is, what is it they want to accomplish in doing it and could we help them meet that need in a, in, a, in a different way so it's it's a much more customized approach to de delivering services um, you know, we, we talked about in other episodes how the DSM gives you a nice diagnosis that's kind of reliable that everybody can agree on, but there's not a lot of validity when you get down to the person that, you know, who, you know the pr depression. So I, I think that in child welfare, the original focus of child welfare had to do with that children were being hurt. And so we wanted to create safety. So we went in and we removed kids or we intervened. That's what we were designed to do. It really wasn't about healing and recovery, right? So, so as, the, as child welfare has progressed away from just the safety issues, I think it has moved more towards a philosophy that's more in line with what Susie and James are talking about is healing and recovery. What is it that I could do with you, not to you, with you to help you begin to, in some ways, um, heal and recover from the, from the injuries and, and pain that you've um, endured and find ways in which to kind of um, in, engage in relationships that are healthy, engage in experiences that are satisfa satisfactory instead of living in your pain and letting your wounds kind of drive you. So I think it's very consistent, the evolution that they're talking about in su substance abuse, that we look at the evolution um, in most of the areas that, that are serving kids and trauma-informed neurobiological developmental understanding has helped drive us in some of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, Jerry, I think you make a lot of really good points. Um, Thank you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's great for us to like, get to finally talk to you all. This is really fun. <laughs> Don't encourage Jerry too much. Yeah, yeah. Only, only one positive affirmation a podcast. <laughs> I think before we get to the idea, the ideas around like how it is that harm reduction and trauma informed both promote healing and recovery, I think it's important to sort of talk about the cyclical relationship between trauma and substance use. And so I think, you know, for those of us who have a lot of experience working with people, and Jerry, you mentioned, you know, what does it do for people? For a lot of people who have experienced trauma, substance use can actually be a way to regulate mood, to take kind of control of what they're feeling. Um, and so substance use can kind of become a coping mechanism for um, the trauma that someone's experienced. Well, and not just substance use, like I think any kind of risky sure. behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see people who've experienced trauma that they're, um, there's like a lot of propensity for them to engage in different risky behaviors and we can understand that through a trauma lens as like a way to try and manage the experience of trauma. So like um, promiscuity would be an example of that. Mm -hmm. So people engage in these risky behaviors 
and they might provide some benefit to the person, but they also increase the person's risk for experiencing additional trauma. Then, re, then being re-traumatized escalates their symptoms and they cope by using what was effective before, which was engaging in this risky behavior again. Mm -hmm. So that cycle, I think, is a really important thing to acknowledge that people who experience trauma are you know, very attached oftentimes to the risky behaviors that they use to help um, soothe themselves. And, and I think um, it was Matt last week who talked about how there can be sort of some safety in habits um, that, that those familiar habits can be something that actually help people feel safe. I, I kind of wonder, I'd love to get your, your perspective on this too. As, uh, from that, you know, we, we talk so much on this, uh, the podcast about help, helping people manage behavioral changes and environmental aspects of that. Just, I, I'm very fascinated what's kind of floating around in your head uh, at, at this point. I, I was listening to the, the points about finding out what this, whatever symptom it is that we're talking about, whether it be substance use, whether it be risky behavior, those cycles and those habits that we're engaging in, finding out what what the purpose is or what the role that that that, that behavior plays in the life of that individual, um, is a is a one of the bedrock concepts that I think that helps um, my science and my field of behavior analysis to really be. Um, commensurate with the field of trauma-informed care is that that's a real commonality between the two. And that that's one of the, the fundamental principles of being an applied behavior analyst is to do a good functional behavior assessment and to find out what is this, what function is this serving in the environment of this individual? And can, do we make changes in the environment or we can, can we make changes in social structures? Can we make changes in, in personal um, um, I don't want to say values, but but things that somebody may uh, value as a, as an outcome that can help to change those functions in a different direction. And certainly, the idea is of harm reduction, where you have a pathway to get from where you started to where you're an, where you're going to end, where your goal is, and have multiple steps along the way to kind of get through that process is the same process that we talk about in behavior analysis. So certainly that's one of the things that I think a lot about is how do I get uh, uh, people from my field to talk to people in other fields. And that's one of the, the areas where I think we have a lot of overlap and a lot of commonality in, in our approaches. Uh, so that's what I was thinking about while we were talking. And I think um, certainly that is one of those areas that I think, you know, in, in the behavior analytic field, you know, we're really... I talk about it as, as uh, we get we get kind of pigeonholed into autism a lot because you know that's that's kind of where you think of, of behavior behavior analysts. I joke with folks that autism is your gateway drug to ABA. That's where you kind of learn about it, right? Because that's where we all are. Um, I've been lucky enough to have experiences outside of that and have gotten really excited and passionate about the applications of the of the technology of what we know um, to populations outside of, of, of those with autism spectrum disorder and, and only developmental disabilities. So, and there's a lot of great, great stuff. Matt, I think you and I were talking about some of Ken Silverman's work um, in substance use uh, and where he's been uh, in Baltimore, in inner, in inner city Baltimore, doing a lot of harm reduction type work using reinforcement contingencies, uh, which is, I think, incredibly important. Uh, th th those are some of my thoughts for sure while, while we were talking. Yeah, and 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 uh, James and Susie, I want to I want to ask you a question too, because what what harm reduction really again is? I started to get when you go into public health, you get bombarded with all these sort of new models of of, of harm reduction. Motivational interviewing came in into my life shortly after that, as well as the trauma stuff uh, that preceded it. But but just by you know almost months, it preceded it. And one of the thinkings that harm reduction, again, when I, when I really kind of try to sit down and, and bring these all together uh, with, with the book, book project that I did, one of the things that, that really struck me was uh, with the stages of change model and harm reduction. And the, the understanding that I, I sort of, and I wish I could just go back and interview myself as a young professional, because I seem to be, have been just oblivious to reality around me. But one of the things that, that it's really helped me think about is that pre-contemplation stage. And if our listeners aren't familiar with the stages of change, 
we, we know that usually people start out, they're not thinking about making a change. And then something happens where they hit contemplation, where they're starting to think about it, preparation, where they now are kind of ready to start planning around it, and then action, where they take it. And I just, uh, one of the powers of harm reduction uh, that I've seen is not putting our uh, sort of values or expectations on, you need to do a different action right now. And I just kind of wonder, I, I know you guys have, uh, this isn't the first time you've heard of stages of change uh, in your work. So just love to hear your thinking about how harm reduction and stages of change sort of helped you uh, structure your, your interventions, Karen, uh, how you think about programming as well. Yeah, you know, um, I think that makes me think of Jerry's point that there are certain like approaches, especially um, encouraging people to go to 12 step programming that works for certain people, but sort of like who are the people it doesn't work for. And I think a lot of times that answer, not just about 12 step, um, but in general, a lot of like sort of treatment as usual, it doesn't work for the pre contemplators. Um, and I think that that's where harm reduction can be really effective in being able to reach people who otherwise are sort of falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that harm reduction really emphasizes that speaks to pre-contemplators is let's figure out a baseline of safety. Um, and even if you're not necessarily looking to or ready to make significant changes to your behavior um, at this time, like what is what are some ways that we can help keep you a little bit safer in doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that like safety is a really good starting point um, that we see from um, kind of looking at like a functional analysis and we think about like people engaging in risky behaviors who have a history of trauma, that a lot of it really centers around safety. Um, and I think sort of where harm reduction and trauma-informed care continue to overlap is in the ideas of then giving people a sense of control. So we're moving beyond just like, can we keep you safe? But do you have a sense of efficacy in your life? Do you feel like you have the ability to make choices, um, which is such a big part of trauma, is like not having enough control. Um, so giving people options to take control with kind of that foundation of safety in place. Um, but then moving also to the idea of connection, um, that it's, it's helpful to have kind of a menu of options, but it's even more helpful to have someone to talk through those with and to think about, well, what will happen if we go down to these different pathways and where will that lead you and how does that compare to where you want to be? Um, so I think in like a lot of different conversations about harm reduction and trauma-informed care, what we really often come back to are the ideas of like safety, control, and connection. Great. Jerry, you look like your brain's spinning over there. Well, what are your... Well, you know, I, I, I you know, I, being as old as I am, um, I've had the opportunity to learn about stages of change and, um, and understanding. But one of the things that has struck me when I've worked with um, some people who are in pre-contemplation um, is that they're not fair, their states aren't very integrated mm. so that when they're in when you're talking to the person who says I, I want this thing to be different with me the person who's actually um, going out and having sex or going out and running away or going out engaging in high arm they're they're not it's not the same person, right? You know, it's, it's in the same body. And I think what it requires really, rather than talking to one person or the other part of the person, is how do I hold this whole person that's in front of me? How do I honor and hold the old person in, in front of me? And I, and I think, you know, stage of change and motivational interview have given people frameworks and understanding of how to do that, which is really good. Um, but for so many of the um, individuals that I've had to work with, both children and families and adults that are involved, um, really people identify with one piece of them. You know, the part of them that wants to stop. Well, my experience is they have that part of them there too. Right? It's just not there when they're having a need to go out and do drugs or having a need to kind of run away. Um, and so 
really is what we want to kind of facilitate at some level is this person being able to um, have that internally, is have that dialogue internally with themselves, as opposed to me having to play the party of you shouldn't be doing drugs or you shouldn't be having unprotected sex or you shouldn't be doing that, right? Is that, <clears throat> you know, in child welfare, I ran residential treatment centers for a very long time with a structure, how to play that external controlling part for a very long time, right? To kind of look at that. And what did we learn is as soon as they got out of that environment, it wasn't internalized. So really the treatment piece, whatever it is, the relationship has to, has to help you to become a more integrated person where there's a part of you that really wants to do drugs and feel better to do it. And there's a part of you that realizes this is creating a problem for you. And how do we have you have that dialogue? So I think that stage of change kind of maps that process out that allows us to do it. And we know some of the kind of trauma work, which kind of deals with kind of internal states, does a similar type of model and we have different language to describe it. But, you know, lots of our clients have had not had the capacity to be in a relationship with somebody who could kind of stay separate from them, but also validate their experiences and kind of do it. So. I think it's an important part of the, the work that, um, that we all do. And it sounds like it's a really important part of the work that um, James and Susie not only do, but teach other people to kind of do, which is really important. And when people are stressed, don't have the supervision, don't have the consultation, it's very hard for them to stay in that state that we're talking about of, of holding another human being and letting them struggle with that. So. I think that's really neat that you uh, identified that and stepped out and not only provide for the clients, but provide for the caretakers as well. Yeah, Jerry, I think a lot of the stuff you're talking about um, really speaks to the idea of connection. I mean, you're just talking just now about how important and valuable establishing relationships with people is, and it is really unique. And I think, you know, one of the things I've like said to people about harm reduction you know, people, I think one of the parts of harm reduction that makes people really uncomfortable, I, in a consultation group, I had a, um, a medical assistant name it to me this way, and I, it really stuck with me. She said, she was actually talking about someone who was in a um, domestic violence relationship, and she said, I feel like if I don't tell her to leave, then I'm telling her to stay. Yeah. And I think that that tension is present for a lot of people when they're trying to use harm reduction. I think what is unique about harm reduction is like you say, it's presenting a new type of relationship for someone. So I like to say there's plenty of people in this person's life already who have told them, stop doing drugs, stop having sex, stop engaging in these risky behaviors, right? There's, if, if all it took was someone to tell them to stop, then they would have stopped by now. And what's different about harm reduction is when you present them a relationship where they're actually collaborating with someone, where they're working together with someone, where they have, uh, you know, the person that they're working with has a deep and profound respect for their humanity and autonomy. Um, that really changes the type of relationship that, that you have with a person. And I think it's that like type of connection that allows someone to, um, to really look at the part of themselves mm -hmm. that wants to keep doing this risky behavior that mm -hmm. rather than sort of having to like obliterate or like dissociate or sort of deny the part of themselves that wants to keep using that we can make space for that part of that person in the relationship also um and to be able to like hold that in connection and i think being able to like reflect and be curious and know that part of themselves um in relationship also then is the process by which they're able to then internalize that and be able to like notice and hold multiple parts of themselves that there's a part of myself that wants to use there's also a part of myself that doesn't um, and i think when people have those conversations externally then they're more able to like maintain that sense of ambivalence and hold that internally right right and it, it sounds like you know james your point of the person who says if i tell them now if i tell them i'm giving them permission they're pretty fragmented too, right? So it's like you're helping them to be more integrated. Like, I can, I, I really want to tell you that you should get out of this relationship because I really care about you and love you, but I also want you to really understand why you're staying. That we have to kind of be integrated with our clients, not just 
kind of helping them to kind of do it. So I think that's a really neat um, kind of point you're making about that, um, that our fragmented clients push us to kind of want to hold on one side of the ambivalence as well. Yeah, actually, so when Susie was talking just now, it reminded me of something that you had said um, on a previous episode, Jerry, about the idea of kind of differentiating between people's coping strategies and who they are as a person. And I think that's something that's really important for us as providers to do. Um, I also think just like what Susie was talking about is that's an important process for an individual to go through as well. <laughs> when it comes to substance use, that is one of the places where people are most likely to you know, when, when they have a problematic or harmful relationship with drugs, to then think that that defines all of who they are, right? Mm -hmm. I'm an addict, I'm a drug user. And they don't think about themselves as a whole person who substance use might be part of their life. It might be a coping strategy. They may have a harmful relationship with that substance, but one relationship doesn't define who they are as a person. Um, I think that's a really important thing that harm reduction does as well here that's really supportive of trauma-informed work is separating between coping strategies and, and who the person is. Yeah. That's nice that you listen to our past episodes. That was really <laughs> <laughs> it's great. We just are homework. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I think, I, 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 yeah, we do appreciate that. We, we have no idea know how many people listen to this podcast, but we, we know there's two now. And my <laughs> wife, when she likes the episode, she'll listen to the whole thing. So maybe three out there. So, uh, but the one thing, the other thing, I, I want to sort of get practical and, and maybe maybe think about harm reduction in, in you know, for, for the, the educators out there or, or for the occupational therapists or all these different folks that I know uh, listen to the podcast or it's just the three of us uh, that listen to it. But, you know, one of the things that, that again, as, as I try to kind of connect these things together, one of the benefits that sort of came out of that, like intellectual exercise for me is really getting concrete on how we help someone reduce harm in their life. Uh, we always talk in trauma-informed care is big about safety, 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 which is definitely should be in the forefront of our mind when we think about folks. But, but I found it, it was a little different approach to safety when I said, okay, here's somebody who's currently experiencing homelessness, uh, maybe uh, injecting drugs on a regular basis, how can not ready to stop using, not ready to get into a housing first program, you know, in that pre-contemplation, contemplation <laughs> area. And, and I really started to think about it. And in my trainings, I do this now is helping people identify what little step can we take to reduce harm. So maybe even if they're not ready to come into a, a methadone clinic, for example, having a conversation about where is a safer place uh, uh, to, to use. Um, maybe you're not ready to get in a housing first program, but hey, if the temperature gets under here, what are, what are the options? And, and, and to me, that, that gave a practicality to safety um, and safety assessments that um, I, I think I missed a lot before I kind of went through this. And I just kind of wonder uh, for our audience, if you, you guys uh, have any uh, practical other practical approaches that, that might be applied sort of universally in, in different uh, uh, settings that our listeners might be in. Yeah, I think sort of like in the, in the big picture, like response to your question, in general, the most we can do to um, reduce barriers to people being able to access services, I think the less harm people will experience. So even if someone isn't necessarily making behavioral changes, they're going to be a little bit safer if they have access to a person that they can talk to, a place they can go, somewhere where they can be warm, where they can just be present at all sometimes as so like a baseline starting point. Um, that can be a struggle. So I think the more that we're able to tolerate as service providers, like the anxiety and discomfort it may bring us, um, and be able to continue to allow people access to services, the more in keeping with harm reduction will be. And I think the more we're going to be reducing someone's risk of re-traumatization, right? That we're a lot more likely to experience trauma again if we don't have like a roof over our head, even if that roof might just be like an emergency shelter. Um, so I think trying to reduce barriers to services is like one sort of broad like stroke kind of category. And then in general, I think, you know, on a more like one individual level, providing people information about 
things that will keep them safer. So I know in our program, we work with a lot of people who, while their ultimate goal, um, their ultimate state goal might be total abstinence from all substances, many of the people we serve are still engaged in pretty daily use, especially when we're talking about like something like heroin. So we talk with people about what do you know about ways to keep yourself safe from overdose? What types of strategies are you already implementing in order to keep yourself a little bit safer? And then helping sort of fill in some gaps and collaborate with the person to make sure they have information to keep themselves safe in what they're doing. Great. James, anything to add to that? I think, you know, what Susie's talking about and I would just kind of add on to is the idea of, you know, we can't decide for people ultimately what they are going to do. What we as service providers have control over is that the people that we work with are making informed choices. Um, and I think the way that we make sure that they're making informed choices is that they're aware of the resources that are out there for them. And so it's not, you know, like Jerry before was what we call shooting, right? Shooting on people. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. This mm -hmm. is dangerous, right? That's, that is giving information in a very assertive, aggressive way. We're talking about trying to start from a place of what does this person know already? So, and I think, you know, where this connects again to trauma informed is the idea of like giving up that expert role, right? So you're an expert in your life. Tell me what you know about this substance, about what it does for you, about what's risky about it, about what you don't like about it, what you, you know, so kind of structuring the conversation and starting from a place of what do you already know about this in your life and what, what purpose it serves? Um, and then, you know, where there are gaps in information. No, I've actually never heard of naloxone before. What is that? Um, you know, filling in those holes for people um, and, and making sure that they do have access to the, to the information. Wonderful. You know, I have a question. Is As you talk about the work you do, really getting to know the person and not their symptoms or not their behavior. Um, it, opens, it opens it up for you to kind of experience some joy of connecting with somebody, but it also opens it up to holding great amounts of pain and suffering. And I, I wonder what you could talk to um, people listening about some things you do that allows you to stay in that space to do the kind of work that you're doing in the way that you're doing it. Because um, really, you know, people ask me, how do I do, how have I done it all these years? But really, I, from from your place, be, meeting people where they're at, what's, how do you take care of yourselves? Well, I think just like to, to your- Like every part of. <laughs> yeah, that's a, really, that's a really good question. Um, but to your point, yeah, um, or the executive director where I used to work, um, Ed Stellan, you know, I remember him saying harm reduction is the harder path, right? It would be easier to turn our back on people or refuse services. Like Susie said, keeping services open to people who engage in risky behaviors is really helpful for them. And like you're saying, it opens us up to a lot more pain because when you work with people who engage in risky behaviors, at times you are going to see them experience harm. And if you're doing the work correctly, you're going to care enough about that person that it will hurt you um, to see someone you care about harmed. Um, so yeah, I think, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a myth that um, the harm reduction is like anything goes and that it's sort of the easier route. Um, th so there's absolutely a lot of um, exposure to vicarious trauma. Um, I think for me, a lot of it is like a parallel process of what that looks like for the people we serve. Is one just like acknowledging and recognizing the impact that my work has on me um, and not sort of like pushing that aside or trying to like avoid or dissociate from it, but also having some good resources, having a like a supportive network. I think that um, when people think about like social workers or counselors, there's this idea that you have this like built-in support system because everyone you work with is really people oriented, um, but this work can be really isolating. There aren't a lot of people, it's like not good dinner party conversation. <laughs> talk about most of my days and what happened. People generally don't wanna hear that. And that's fair, because that's not something they've signed up for, right? That's a choice that I've made. So I think being able to find the people who you can have really con like in-depth conversations about what does this work look like and how how do I manage to 
um, kind of keep going at times and where are the places that I can have support? I think we're really fortunate that we have kind of a built-in like <laughs> support system. Um, so we definitely talk about our days quite a bit. Um, but one of the things that I also know James has been talking about a lot lately that really resonates with me is the idea of vicarious resilience, that we are absolutely witness to a lot of vicar vicarious trauma or we experience a lot of vicarious trauma. But I, I see amazing things every day. Um, and so being able to choose, make choices to view my work um, and the people I serve through that lens. I don't know if you want to fill in more about Yeah, that. I mean, just like thinking about the lengths that people go to to get the services that we provide, like to me, that is an example of vicarious resilience. And so one of the things I often talk about in terms of what we call harm reduction for the harm reductionist, um, but essentially like the self-care for, for people who are practicing harm reduction is taking that same mantra of celebrating any positive change and applying it to your work. And I think oftentimes, you know, what, what we're so concerned with is the final outcome, the ultimate victory. And in a lot of ways, we're sort of structured to look at those as our, as our measuring stick, right? Is the person housed? Do they have a job? Are they completely abstinent? Mm -hmm. And I think if those are the only things that we celebrate about our work, then the victories are few and far between. And instead, recognizing where we do find joy in the work on a daily basis. So that person who we know sleeps outside but still walks five miles to get to our treatment program to show up for a three-hour group, right? Seeing that person can, can bring you some joy and can bring you some kind of a lift to your spirit. Um, I think, so I have to tell the story. We, <laughs> so one of our favorite outreach stories uh, is there was a client who we engaged on the street. He slept outside um, in the same part of um, Chicago under a viaduct for at least, I would say, probably a total of two years he was out there. He was out there probably longer than that, but we, we were engaging with him for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, this is a person who, when we would come by, we'd be passing out snack bars and saying hello to people and sitting down and having conversations. And he was always kind of to himself, didn't really seem like he wanted to be engaged. And we gave a lot of respect for the space that he was indirectly asking us for. You know, we would offer him a snack bar, um, you know, say hello and kind of move along. We always ask his permission if we could come back and talk to him again. Of like, hey, if we see here again, is it okay if we come by and, you know, stop in and talk with you? And he would say yes, but none of our conversations really ever lasted more than maybe one minute. Um, it was pretty brief engagement, but we saw him almost every week for about 14 months. And you hear in there, like what Susie's talking about, would it be okay if we come back again? The idea of control, right? Giving that person control, even in that brief interaction. And I remember the first day that Susie and I were like, this is, you know, probably after a year of trying to outreach this client, we were walking up to him and we saw him notice us and smile. And it was just that little thing that him, after, after all these all, all this time and all this work that we put into trying to engage with this person that he saw us coming and it made him smile and we got back to the office after doing outreach that day and jumped up and down and celebrated because we were just so happy that this was the accomplishment right nothing you know where he was sleeping that night didn't change but the fact that there's somebody in his life right now who when, it, when we walk up to him he has a smile on his face those are the kind of joyful moments and those, you know, small celebrate, small victories that we should be celebrating. And I think those are the kind of things that can really help us get through some of the, the tough times and the, the painful things that we also see in doing the work. Yeah, I think a lot of being a harm reductionist is really holding on to like a growth mindset that mm -hmm. in the same way that for the people we serve, we don't have these sort of fixed outcomes and unless they achieve them that we, they've been successful. I think we have to hold on to that for ourselves that um, I don't have to be perfect in my work. Um, I need to figure out ways to keep coming back to it and to find for myself also like any positive change. Great. I, I just, I, I, feel, I feel like one of the things harm reduction, uh, you know, is, is with trauma, I had a very similar reaction to it is um, as soon, and I, I'm going to kind of end on this note because I know we're hitting about the time, but I can't let harm reduction go without talking a little bit about the social justice aspect of it. Um, I think needle exchange, e even in the fairly liberal uh, Denver, uh, you know, we, we saw our city council members who 
you know, are pretty much on the progressive spectrum or, or claim to be on about almost everything, um, really struggle with the fact um, if we give people a clean needle, we're promoting drug use. Uh, uh, not having abstinence, only what, whatever, fill in the blank after that. And so it, it took me about five minutes to learn about harm reduction and then become an advocate for harm reduction. And I would just sort of like to, to wrap up our conversation today. Uh, to, for, for me, you two seem to be self-actualized on this from the moment I met both of you. But I, I just kind of want to see, I know as people who um, advocacy is a part of your work, social justice is a part of uh, your DNA as well, just how this sort of informs your work and any suggestion for our audience members who might not be doing um, substance abuse or, or work in, in the homeless arena, um, how they can support uh, these efforts kind of at a community-wide uh, basis as well. And, and again, so your experience and anything you might give to our audience. So there's, a, again, there's a lot I could say about this, but so trying to keep it short, a few things. The roots of harm reduction really are as a movement for the human rights of people who use drugs. And it doesn't come from service providers being, you know, having this great idea one day that this would be a good way to serve people. It really comes from the fact that people in vulnerable, marginalized communities were recognizing the risks that they were exposing themselves to. So in this country, that really happened around the HIV AIDS crisis in the 1980s um, and started helping each other out. And so that I think is a really important place and why client-centered is so, being client-centered is so fundamental to doing harm reduction work is it's really about people helping themselves and helping their own communities. And so I think that's a really um, important point just to make about how human rights connects to social justice. Mm -hmm. And then um, how people can support this in their own communities. Um, I like, you know, we always talk about NIMBYism, um, you know, YIMBY, we gotta make that a thing because there's always somebody willing to stand up and say, oh, I don't like that person there. I don't want that program in my neighborhood. When you want the program in your neighborhood, you need to stand up and say, say it. You need mm -hmm. to be there. When the city council members are saying, I don't know about this syringe exchange, you need to be there and say, this is the compassionate thing to do. This is the you know, appropriate public health response. This is the, the, um, you know, the response that recognizes that person's humanity. Um, and so standing up, I think, in those moments to, to call for these services being really skeptical anytime we hear people saying that our solution to someone's substance use is to punish them further, um, questioning those people and asking, you know, why is it that we think that that's the appropriate response for this person? Um, you know, I, we've said like, you know, we've tried tough love for 50 years now when it comes to our drug policy, and maybe it's time we just give love a shot. That loving and caring about people is an approach that we really haven't given an earnest attempt at yet. And I think that that could really shift and change the way that people who use drugs, um, you know, live their lives in, in our society. Yeah, I think I would just add to that. So James is the extrovert between us. Um, so for him, <laughs> showing up at like a town hall meeting feels much more within his comfort zone. And, like, and he looks so good in a suit. Like his <laughs> iron, it fits, I mean. <laughs> So for any fellow introverts out there, I think having these conversations on a smaller scale is also important of like, yes, we need to talk to like our representatives. We also need to talk with each other. So being able to have conversations with your friends and family about like just sort of gently pushing back and asking questions about like, where do you think that comes from? And why is it so different when we're talking about drug use versus so many other parts of our lives where we engage in risky activities all the time. Um, so like cars are a good example that like those are dangerous, but like we still do it and we put things into place to make it a little bit safer and we accept that there's probably some risk that's going to happen. Um, so being able to ask like, why is it different, different with drug use and why is it different with certain people's drug use and being able to have those conversations amongst ourselves. Um, so that when someone's thinking about going to a town hall meeting, it's not the first time that they've had that kind of conversation. <laughs> Great points from both sides of the perspective. So 
I, I want to thank both James and Susie. I, I knew this was going to be a great episode, and, and you guys did not disappoint. Sorry for my technical glitch there. When you have construction being done on both sides of uh, your house, uh, that happens from time to time. So uh, my apologies to the audience and our guests, and, and even Kurt and Jerry on, on that end. But uh, I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll um, share ways to get in contact with you both, if you're okay with that, in our, in our show notes at Trauma Informed Lens. Dot, dot org. You, you guys are still doing trainings, right, as well from time to time? Oh, great. I, I got the head nods there. So um, I, I've, seen, I've seen both of them in action. They're, they're really uh, a great trainers, and, and you've got a little sense and feel for that here as well. So I want to thank James, Susie, Kurt, uh, Jerry. Again, you can find our show notes, some discussion questions if you want to uh, bring this to your team at traumainformedlens.org. Uh, I want to also give a shout out to Terry Barney, who hopefully is listening to this on her commute in uh, Connecticut. Uh, she's an OT therapist that gave us some great feedback. Uh, we love great feedback, so you can also throw that at uh, traumainformedlens.org too. So Terry, thanks for your, uh, your kind words and uh, keep up the great OT work out there in Connecticut. So thanks everybody for your time and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, thanks so much. James and Susie for making the world a better place. Absolutely. So much for <laughs> us.